What makes your life meaningful is projects. And if you have one huge project sitting squarely in the middle of your life and covering most of it, that's the meaning of your life. Welcome to the Manifested Wellbeing Podcast. I'm Leandro, your host. Today's guest is Elijah Milgram. Dr. Milgram teaches philosophy at the University of Utah in Salt Lake City. He has written books about learning what matters from experience, about the ways ethical theories depend on theories of rationality, about reasoning using steps that are understood to be only partially true, and about the philosophical implications of division of labor. His most recent book is titled John Stuart Mill and the Meaning of Life. Dr. Milgram, thank you very much for being here today. Thanks for having me. Could you comment about your work as a philosophy te teacher and your main focus of research, please? Uh, sure. So, um, actually, uh, so my, my research has two main foci, and one of them is the meaning of life. Uh, this is a, a little bit unusual for an academic philosopher. Um, uh, it's not, academic philosophers will talk about an AOS, an area of specialization. Mm -hmm. And the meaning of life is not a normal area of specialization, but it is one of mine. I actually went into philosophy and went to college in the first place to think about the the meaning of life. Um, I can say a little bit about how that went. Um, yes, I, uh, when I was, I guess, late teens, maybe 20 or so, um, I had, I guess you'd call it an existential crisis. Uh, life and the world seem meaningless to me by what I would now call a rigorous argument. You know, in order for something to matter or be important, something else has to matter and be important, and then something else for that has to matter and be important, and eventually you run out. And I thought to myself at the time, well, um, okay, um, either life is meaningless or it's not. Um, if it's not, and I become a philosopher, I might figure out what the meaning of life is. And if life is meaningless and the world is meaningless, then what I'm doing won't be any more of a waste of time than anything else I could do. So it really has been my focus and something I've been thinking about for a very long time. My other focus is theory of rationality. So I'm very bossy. I try to tell people how they should think. And um, uh, sometimes when it's thinking about what the facts are, what philosophers call theoretical reasoning, it comes out, I end up writing about truth, and it looks like metaphysics and epistemology. And sometimes uh, when it's about thinking about what uh, to do, uh, what philosophers call practical reasoning or practical rationality, then it comes out looking like uh, ethics or moral philosophy. But as you'll see, if you look at the book, the, these um, two interests overlap and there's a lot of shared, uh, uh, there, there are points of connection between them. Okay, thank you. And in your last work in John Stuart Mill and the Meaning of Life, why did you decide to, to write such book? Well, um, I realized that when you're thinking about the meaning of life, you need to think about lives. I mean, specific, concrete lives that you can use as, uh, well, test cases that uh, show you how a, the, a particular approach to meaningfulness in a life plays out in the life, not how it's advertised, what the hype is, but what really happens. And only then can you kind of stand back and decide what you think. And I had uh, run into John Stuart Mill um, under the heading of ethics. Um, this is how philosophers nowadays normally encounter him. And, um, but when I looked into it, it turned out that he wasn't, well, he wasn't just an ethicist within philosophy, but he wasn't just a philosopher. He was also a, uh, in the first place, a political activist. He was a colonial administrator. He worked for the uh, British East India Company, which at the time was the entity that ran India, the British colony. He wasn't exactly an economist because that wasn't a classification then, but the, the, the predecessor of what we think of as economics was called political economy, and he was a theorist of political economy. At one point, he was a member of parliament. So it was a very interesting life, but also it was a perfect fit for what's now, um, I think, the default view of the meaning of life, which is that um, what makes your life meaningful is projects, 
And if you have one huge project sitting squarely in the middle of your life and covering most of it, that's the meaning of your life. So that was why Mel. Okay. Uh, we have covered a little bit about how, who was John Stuart Mills. And could you talk about, about Mills' childhood as well? Okay, well, that's a good way of maybe filling in more of who he was um, by giving that sort of backstory. So stepping back a little bit, um, uh, his father, uh, James Mill, um, uh, was a friend of Jeremy Bentham's. And the two of them were central figures in, at the time, the very, very small radical movement called the Philosophical Ra Philosophic Radicals at the time, later renamed by John Stuart Mill uh, the Utilitarians. Um, and when John Stuart was born in, I guess, 1806, he was raised, okay, it's probably um, maybe uh, a little too dramatic to describe it this way. I don't know that they were um, that James Mill and Jeremy Bentham thought they were bringing up the ultimate super activist as a sort of home psychology experiment, that they were making the Lenin of, Lenin of utilitarianism in their lab. But it's almost like that. It's like a comic book origin story. And so part of this, which is what people who know something about Mill tend to already know, is his very fast forward education. Um, his father... Uh, started him off on ancient Greek at, I think, age three. And I think maybe it was Latin at five. I can't quite remember. And by the time he was 20, it was as though he had two or three advanced degrees, even though he'd never been to school. He was homeschooled. Um, his father had been, when he was a child, was working on a social history of India. And so the picture you should have is, you know, there's a big table. And at one end of the table is little John Stewart doing his Greek homework. And at the other end of the table is his dad, uh, James Mill, uh, writing his History of India. And every now and again, his father lifts up his head to glower at his child to make sure that his child is still doing his homework. Okay, so that's one side of it. The other side, which people know about less, is, well, his father, like John Stuart Mill, had many sides to him. I mean, besides being a political activist and a, and a writing a History of India, He was a psychologist, and he wrote a uh, – you should think of it as a psychology textbook in a way. It's called The Analysis of the Phenomena of the Human Mind. And it's really instructive and kind of fascinating to imagine what it would be like to uh, raise somebody to, uh, – to treat this book as a guide to child rearing. Um, what it would be like to be brought up by somebody who thought this. And I suppose I should give you a little bit of an introduction to the ideas. Okay. He was an associationist. You don't um, – um, it's a defunct psychological theory, uh, but it's um, an ancestor of two more familiar theories today. It's an ancestor of behaviorism in the old school Skinner style and also of modern connectionist like machine learning AI. Um, so it's different from – so old school behaviorism is about – um, you build associations, connections, uh, but you train connections in between stimuli and responses. It's all external. It's outside the mind. Uh, behavior so, uh, associationists thought they were doing something like this, but with ideas inside the mind. So you have two ideas, maybe A and B. You think first A, then B. A, then B, A, then B. And after a while, a connection is built between A and B. So when you think of A, your mind is just carried over to B, and pleasure and pain flow across these associative connections. So here's what's different with, between this and connectionism. Uh, modern AI, you have these, you think of the mind as a network of these nodes, but the, no, the nodes don't have local contents. Represent, representation is distributed over the network. The way the, associate, the associationists thought of it, one of these ideas would have, there would be content it had locally right there. It, it was an idea of something. So it's a little bit different than how we do things nowadays. So, uh, John Stuart Mill was being raised by his father, who was the association psychologist, who was conditioning him to be, well, first of all, who's being brought up to be an activist in this radical political movement. And that worked. John Stuart Mill stayed a utilitarian until the day of his death. And also he was being brought up into work habits. Um, these are remarkable work habits. Nowadays, there's a collected works of John Stuart Mill. It's 30 odd volumes. 
And when you look at these volumes, I have one here, they're, they're tomes, they're like book, books, they're like doorstops, right? Um, he did all of this in his spare time because as I think I mentioned, he had a day job. He worked at the British East India Company. So this guy had amazing work habits. And that's that's the result of his upbringing. Oh, incredible. And if you go a little bit about the influences, and if you could talk about a bit the Jeremy Bentham, who was Jeremy Bentham? And as a second question, how Bentham ideas influenced Stuart Mew? So Bentham, he's a very interesting, he's a strange character. So on the one hand, you want to think of him as the founding spirit of utilitarianism. He's the, uh, the Marx of the movement. He's the sort of founding ideologue. And uh, what most people know about utilitarianism is that it's built around the principle of utility, which is the idea that um, everything, all decisions should be made to max out utility. And Bentham understood utility as um, the sensation of pleasure. More carefully, the balance, he thought of pain as a sensation too, so the balance of the mix, the balance of pleasure over pain. Um, now, every now and again, it's very rare, I run it to somebody who I think of as a natural utilitarian. So not somebody who's been argued into believing that utility is the only thing that matters or has been driven to it as a theoretical position, but somebody to whom in his own life is just obvious that the only thing that matters is pleasure and avoiding pain, and that's it. It's unusual, but you encounter people like this. And I'm convinced that Bentham was like this. He was a natural utilitarian. That was just the way he thought. So on the one hand, this is one side of him. The other is, this is a guy who had no sense of what was normal and never let normal get in the way of either how he did things or what he, how he thought things should be done. And sometimes this played out in, you know, Bentham had endless and often very convincing proposals uh, for reforming the endlessly broken ways that things are, were and are still being done. Stuff that sounds very sensible. Uh, for example, an argument for representative democracy where everyone gets to vote. I mean, if some people don't get to vote, then there'll be distortions, their interests will be left out of the system. Sounds plausible, right? On the other hand, well, I guess the icon for this, although there are many things like this in his life and in his writing, but the most famous and maybe the, the one worth, most worth knowing about because it's great London tourism is the auto icon. So um, Bentham thought, you know, when you die, your family will want something to remember you by, a kind of souvenir, right? And what better souvenir than to have yourself stuffed and sitting around the living room, kind of like, you know, a trophy a hunter brought back and took to a taxidermist. So this is somebody who genuinely doesn't know what normal human reactions are like. Right. Um, and he had something like this done to himself. So it's not really taxidermy. But if you go to... Uh, 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 I guess it's on Mallet Street, Senate House. It's a building in the University of London. And you go into like the big space on the main floor and you look around. There'll be something like a hutch that somebody's grandmother might keep the nice china in. But when you go to the hutch, there's no china. It's Jeremy. Wow. Not all of him, of course. Uh, so the head is his death mask. The head wasn't – preserving the head didn't work out so well. The actual head has the kind of expression that you see in horror movies – by the character before the monster, as the monster is attacking. Um, and I'm not sure you should believe this next part. Um, it has the sound to me of an urban legend, but I'll tell you the urban legend, and so you know, take it with this qualification. Um, so you know how um, in the United States, the colleges will develop traditions where every year the frat boys steal the clapper out of the bell. Um, a tradition developed where students would try, college students would try to steal Jeremy Bentham's head, and so now they keep it locked away in a safe where people can't get at it. Maybe that's right, maybe it's not, I don't know. Anyway, he's the, the, the marks of the movement, and he's a very strange guy. Okay, wonderful. And could you explore a little bit more about the, the principle of utility, like what utilitarianism is, and also why would that be relevant to us today? Okay. 
Um, well, I'm going to explain this a little bit differently than you would get in a classroom okay. nowadays. The thing to remember is that the utilitarians, or as they called themselves then, the philosophic radicals, um, they started out as a left-wing political movement. And so, like most parties, they had many different points in their platform. Mm. Now, one of these was the idea that there's the idea that there's only one thing that matters, and that's utility, which early on was uh, the sensation of pleasure or that balance of pleasure over pain. And so, of course, they thought everyone's utility mattered equally. And so um, all decisions, but policy decisions in the first place, were supposed to be aimed at maxing out that overall balance of pleasure over pain. Now, if you think about it, this isn't actually a very grown up view. I mean, small children have this idea that it's all about pleasure and only pleasure. And it wasn't all that closely tied to the philosophic radicals, other policy recommendations. Um, it's kind of remarkable how often Bentham simply neglected to tie some proposal to the official benchmark. But then in the next generation, the young John Stuart Mill, as he traversed his career, well, first he reformulated the principle of utility, that directive to always be guided by utility, um, in the first place by reconceiving what utility was in a way that made it much more grown up. I can explain this in sort of three passes. Okay. So first, um, instead of being about how you feel, the sensation, it became about getting people getting what they want. That's still a little bit childish. John Dewey says, it's only a child who thinks, I want it, is a compelling reason. <laughs> but then, when you figure out what you want, I guess you could call this the IMDB and Rotten Tomatoes theory of what you want. You take account of what people have already tried out what you think tried out what you want and you see what they think. So, you know, if you go, if you're thinking of seeing a movie, first you check Rotten Tomatoes and you find out what people have already seen the movie, how, right. And then the third pass is making room in all of that for serious commitment to this, that there are things that you want in a way that it won't make sense for you to trade them away. They just don't trade off against other desirable items. And that's what makes it grown up. And John Stuart Mill, he took his task to be integrating that conception of utility with more sophisticated versions, of course, of older elements of the philosophic radicals, the utilitarian's policies. For example, freedom of speech, um, uh, that had been argued to be the kind of thing that the philosophical radicals were in favor of it. Mill argued that freedom of speech was the sort of thing you just don't trade off on the basis of this reconceived notion of utility. Nowadays, people think of uh, utilitarianism as just you, the, the, that central notion of utility, the principle of utility, and we tend to forget that it was, was part of and had been shaped to be part of a package of quite specific policies. Now, you ask why is it relevant today? If you look through the the list of kind of core planks, um, they're, they look like foundational building blocks of the modern democratic state. Um, representative government, where you design the institutions so that they conduct political deliberation seriously. Responsible governance driven by cost-benefit analyses. Uh, gender equality, right? Equality, equal rights for women. A public education, right? Uh, a state mandated, state subsidized education for everybody. Um, the list kind of goes on, and it's all these things that, okay, I've been working on this book. I worked on it for like 20 years. And when I started, I thought one of the reasons we want to pick Mill's Life Project um, as the test case is because nobody out there, nobody mainstream, would think there was anything wrong with any of this stuff. It's a done deal. But over the course of the last 20 years, it's emerged that there are now, I guess, large segments of the electorate in many states that are moving away from these foundation stones. Um, and so now is a very good time to stop and go back and rethink, take a look at what the reasons were originally for these institutional structures, because these institutional structures are being questioned and even attacked. So 
uh, utilitarianism and Mill's, that is the package of policies and Mill's reasons for it is suddenly relevant in a way that I had never imagined it would be when I started writing this. It's very clear you explain. And what I cannot see clearly is mm -hmm. the connection that there is with utilitarianism and meaning of meaning in life, if you could clarify a little bit, what would be this connection? Oh, okay. So, well, utilitarianism is the meaning of John Stuart Mill's life. And I wouldn't necessarily recommend anyone else adopting it as the meaning of their lives. So some people seem to. I haven't checked in on what Peter Singer has been doing recently, but I remember he used to have a very big project built around some, uh, I guess it looked to me like Benthamism, actually. Um, so in this book, I'm treating utilitarianism as part of a case study. It's, yeah. you know, the case study is Mill's life. But there are things to learn from thinking utilitarianism through for the meaning of life, both for philosophers and for people circling around the question in other ways. Okay, if you, if you make one principle, so in this case, it's everybody be happy. If you make that your bottom line, the basis for all of your justifications, well, then how do you justify it? Okay, if it's not the sole anchor for your concerns, it's not a problem. If somebody asks me why happiness matters, I can just start giving a list of reasons. Um, just to start off, if you're unhappy, it's bad for your relationships and it gets in the way of you know work. And um, and there's, there's kind of more philosophically interesting stuff to say maybe. There's a philosopher who I like a lot, uh, Sarah Buss at Michigan, who has a paper about what's wrong with being unhappy. And she has a very interesting suggestion, which is that it involves a kind of incoherence. Yeah. But okay, but if being happy or whatever it is, is the sole bottom line, well, if you're a philosopher, it becomes an intellectual problem. And that's one that Mill gave a good deal of attention to. But if you're not a philosopher, and even if you are, um, sticking with the example, the principle of utility, if you're at all thoughtful and you're resting that much weight on one thing, on the importance of happiness, you have to have something to say to yourself about why it matters. And if you don't, that will undermine and erode your commitment to it. And in extreme cases, you get an existential crisis. So when you uh, start thinking about, especially if you're a natural utilitarian, so it seems appealing to you, if you start thinking about that one thing that's at the bottom of your life, for most people, when you start thinking for, with, about such concerns, it quickly becomes apparent to you how thin your sense of, well, why it's important uh, uh, um, and how little you have to say about it. Um, now, of course, at that point, some people and also many philosophers, they double down, right? They just insist that whatever it is, happiness maybe is important and the only thing. But if you're not dogged in that way, um, then you start to think, okay, uh, why is this? Why should this be a big deal for me? And then you're on your way to thinking about the meaning of life. You're just two steps away from it. Okay. The, the, look, when I think about utility, I'm thinking about happiness, but the type of happiness that is not eudaimonia. is like this type of happiness, something connected to pleasure, and the more pleasure I have, the happiest I am. However, for something to be meaningful, in my view, uh, please correct me if I'm wrong, it doesn't necessarily have, uh, have to be pleasant. And how you... First of all, what's your, your opinion about this and how utilitarian, utilitarianism would reconcile this idea? Mm, okay, so remember that, I mean, Mill wasn't particularly enjoying himself. On the contrary, he, uh, he confessed to his protege and friend and ultimately biographer, Alexander Bain, uh, late on in his life. For him... Uh, it wasn't about experiencing pleasure. Uh, he just tried to ward off some of the pain. And he struck people around him as a self-denying ascetic workaholic. Uh, rather, utility, right, the happiness of other people was the content of his project. Um, it was the objective all of his efforts were devoted to. Now, okay, so as far as figuring out how 
project structure or life and what happens to the life they structure, there's nothing special about utilitarianism. Many different contents will do. But in this case, you might be thinking, so here's the problem. Okay, if happiness is one thing and meaningfulness is another, okay. um, and having a happy life wouldn't necessarily make your life meaningful, how could it make your life meaningful to be making lots of other people happier? In Mill's case, I think that worry isn't as bad as it sounds. So remember, he was getting involved in an already up and running political program. The principle of utility was an orienting device, an orienting device. It was a capstone that made it cohesive. And the political program was meant to address the social ills of Victorian England. Now, Victorian England, by our lights nowadays, were a lot richer than they are. It's a dystopian nightmare. It's of dismal and extreme poverty and short lifespans and a horrifically uneducated populace and unresponsive governance. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to get a sense of this, there's a book, I guess this is Thompson, The Making of the English Working Class. Mm -hmm. So this wasn't about some abstraction, the happiness of all. This was addressing a many-sided and urgent social crisis. And Mill was stepping up and putting himself on the line. And so if somebody came to him and said, um, hey, uh, what's so meaningful about pleasure, it would have seemed to him, but also to other people, like you hadn't really been paying attention to what he was really doing. So in his case, I think it's less of an urgent worry. Okay, I understand. You, in your book, you also mentioned that uh, Mills had a, a mental crisis. And what, if you could comment what happened and how it affected his ideas as well. Okay, so you remember that turn I was describing that one would experience, I mean, I guess a couple questions back, um, to asking, you know, why something is important to you. Yeah. Um, that's how Mill understood not exactly a nervous breakdown, but an emotional collapse that's become, well, so famous that in certain circles it has its own name, Mill's Mental Crisis. Uh, since I have the book here, I'll read you his description of it. Yes, please. Um, so he's been describing, you know, what he's been doing, which is his involvement in this uh, utilitarian political project. And he says, but the time came when I awakened from this as from a dream. It was the autumn of 1826. So he's about 20. I was in a dull state of nerve, such as everyone is occasionally liable to, unsusceptible to enjoyment or pleasurable excitement. Uh, one of those moods when what is pleasure at other times becomes insipid or indifferent. I'll skip a little bit. In this frame of mind, it occurred to me to put the question directly to myself. Suppose that all your objects in life were realized, that all the changes in institutions and opinions which you were looking forward to could be completely affected at this very instant. Would this be a great joy and happiness to you? And an irrepressible self-consciousness distinctly answered, no. At this, my heart sank down within me. The whole foundation on which my life was to have been constructed fell down. All of my happiness was to have been found in the continual pursuit of this end. The end had ceased to charm, and how could there ever again be any interest in the means? I seem to have nothing left to live for. Mm. Um, Mill diagnosed himself, and Candace Vogler at Chicago has a nice book that makes this out. Um, he thought he had realized that he only cared about the utilitarian project because he'd been conditioned into it, and that wasn't enough of a reason to care. Um, he kept working as hard as ever. No, no one else knew there was anything wrong, but it was empty and hollow because he couldn't see why. Now, for what it's worth, I'm pretty sure it's a misdiagnosis. So I won't give away the, so, right, no spoilers. But Mill gives various explanations of three of them, actually, of how he managed to bounce back from his mental crisis, and they absolutely don't fit that diagnosis. Um, here's what I think the lesson is for philosophical methodology of Mill's mental crisis. He understands himself to be living out an argument. If certain things are true, you should have an existential crisis and become depressed. Um, now, although most lives don't live out arguments, sometimes they do. I think Mill's whole life lives out an argument. And when they do, uh, you can think through questions, especially in moral philosophy, by looking at the life. And that's mm -hmm. what I'm trying to do here. Okay, thank you very much. And could you move a bit and talk about, uh, I'm thinking about the principle of liberty. And 
its relationship with agency as well. If you could talk about the principle of liberty and with the focus on, on thinking why have having agency is important and related to liberty, please. Okay. Um, let's see. So students tend to know about the principle of liberty. It's always introduced as an intellectual puzzle for utilitarianism. Um, but this will make more sense if I start in by describing how for real it was a personal problem. But I'll be methodical. I mean, so that everybody who's listening is on board. I'll, let me kind of say the what the principle of liberty is, and then the I'll kind of mark the textbook puzzle. And then I'm going to tell you what Mill did with the problem of free will. So the principle of liberty is basically the idea that you should be able to do anything you decide to as long as it's not actually harming someone else. So other people don't get to tell you, uh, sorry, you can't because it's offensive to us or bad for you or violates some, I don't know, religious stricture we have or whatever. And there's an important special case, um, freedom of speech and of the press, interpreted roughly the way that the American legal system has come to uh, uh, understand the uh, U.S. Constitution's First Amendment. So pretty much you get to say and publish what you want, no matter how upset other people are going to be. So, and here's why it's a puzzle. You know, utilitarianism is about making as many people as possible, as happy as possible. And if you're a troll and what you say is going to upset a lot of people, shouldn't they stop you? Right? And if what you're going to do over and above speech is suboptimal, you know, instead of putting your shoulder to the wheel and helping out, you're planning to spend the next few weeks uh, lounging around the house and doing screen time. I mean, shouldn't that be prohibited? I mean, it's time for government mandated screen time limits, right? Mm. Okay. <laughs> so endless numbers of students get assigned papers where they're told to explain how a utilitarian can possibly support the principle of liberty. But now think about the context. For Mill's political movement, it was a political puzzle. I mean, they were already supporters of greater liberties, and the principle of liberty was of utility was already supposed to be the centerpiece or maybe the capstone of their program. So Mill was given, inherited, an ideological challenge of integrating these ideas. But for him, it was personal. And I think, okay, this will go the long way around. So remember that mental crisis. Um, Mill ended up thinking that living the way he had, completely immersed in his life project, had been destroying his free will. He spent an enormous amount of time figuring that out. Most philosophers who work on free will don't know that Mill worked up not just one, but two different accounts of freedom of the will. And they're both really interesting. They're ingenious. They're quite surprising. But now, in circling back to liberty, so Mill identified a configuration, a personality configuration, uh, moral freedom. It's one of these things that you take completely seriously and that if you know what you're doing, you don't trade it off for anything. So moral freedom is a state of, it's roughly psychological balance. There's no one motivation that's so dominating that you don't have other motivations that you could muster, that you could invoke to override it. And since Mill had inherited the associationist psychology from his father, um, he even edited a second edition of his father's psych textbook. Mill was very attentive to the way that personalities are shaped by the social and institutional structures they inhabit. And long story short, it turns out that moral freedom, that psychological balance, it comes from being in a position to figure things out for yourself, and that requires liberty. And so if you know what you're doing, you're not going to trade your liberty in for anything else either. Here's... I think a little takeaway, it's an interesting takeaway, Mill's blueprints for the society that we live in, they turn out to be driven by a solution to a very personal problem he was trying to solve. He was trying to reshape his own personality to get back his free will, and um, he was designing institutions that would do that for everyone. Yeah, wonderful. Um, I'm think I'm trying to... to, to think i'm thinking about what you said and you the principle there's a point that the principle of utility would clash with the principle principle of liberty for one side you have the more people happy the better and for, for another side 
um, this could also decrease the overall level of happiness. Let's say, as you gave an example, that you know, if I say things that upset upset people, or what I don't really understand is this line between: Am I doing something that physically harms someone? Would decrease overall level of happiness, or just by saying things just upset people. So, could you help me to clarify the, this distinction, or if there is no di this distinction at all? So, um, let me actually speak to what you're worried about, but I'll go at it in a different way. So, the okay. way you raised the, the way you raised the question, it's. There's an enormous literature. It's about um, if you were sort of Googling it, you would Google the harm principle. Yep. And philosophers sort of fight over this and political theorists fight over this in a way that resembles, I don't know, the interpretation of biblical texts. Right? And I don't want to go there. Yeah. Uh, here's a better way to think about it. Mill is concerned to protect something that um, has become of interest to philosophers again, moral philosophers again, yeah. and um, which most people don't think of as central to political discussion at all. Um, so Mill calls this originality. Originality is figuring things out for yourself. Yeah. And it's also, it's the precondition for having, okay, so in um, contemporary moral philosophy, since about 1970, there's been a lot of discussion of what it takes to have thoughts that are genuinely full-fledgedly your own. And Mill's answer is, you have to figure, the thought is your own when you figure it out for yourself. Um, the, uh, the thing that's being protected, and which would determine, okay, what's going to be a harm and what's not, right? The, thing, the consideration at the bottom is protecting originality. Now, originality doesn't mean necessarily figuring out something that no one has ever figured out before. Mm. Right. Um, uh, when you understand something that's maybe very well known to other people, that you really understand it, right? That's your original thought too. And he's trying to he's trying to keep mm. that. Okay. Um, I'm thinking now in in a more more practical way, like for people like me that we are not formally trained on philosophy and thinking about the meaning of life you 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 say that having a project can it's you can have a meaning in life by having a project but could you describe different elements for for people like me that it will create meaning in life being a bit more um more elements just just having a project uh, what kind of elements the project would have to have to to create meaning well i'm going to be a little bit coy about that um and also i don't want you know spoilers um but let me uh talk about it uh this way yeah so this book is part of a uh it, um it's the first lap of a larger uh, uh larger philosophical enterprise um so if you think about the way it works out in mill's life um, mm -hmm. what, the meaning of his life, the giant project sitting in the middle of it, yeah. um, it makes sense as um, it has the role that it has because the life is completely mobilized. It's entirely cohesive. Everything hangs together and everything subserves that one thing. And Although Mill's life is enormously impressive and uh, a it's full of remarkable accomplishments, um, it's also, the more you look at it, the more you realize that it's a, it's a very subtle train wreck. And it's a train wreck because it's mobilized into that single project. So uh, the takeaway for me is, so don't, the, the first takeaway is don't, do this. Don't turn your life into a giant project. It works out badly. But then when you're thinking about the meaning of life, you want to pivot away. To, so the next place to look is to ask, um, what would be the role of meaningfulness in a life and of the meaning of life in a life that was much more loosely organized, that wasn't uh, 
uh, so cohesive and so focused and, and, and so tied together. And as I think I mentioned earlier on, I try to think through these questions by looking at particular concrete lives. The life I'm now investigating is under this heading is that of Friedrich Nietzsche. Um, and so, uh, 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 stay tuned. Great. Great. Uh, we are near the end of our conversation and as it's tradition in this podcast, I will ask a series of questions. If you could tell us, uh, what is your favorite book? If you could cho choose one. Well, um, so, you know, if you read a lot, I mean, maybe people who don't read as much as I read have a favorite book, but if you read as much as me, you don't have a favorite book. So instead, let me tell you about a book I'm very much into recently. Sure. Uh, uh, this is by Norbert Elias. Uh, he was a, uh, a PhD student in Germany between the wars. And, well, you know, Nietzsche says somewhere that we've become tame animals. And Nietzsche has a sort of made up, not historically very well documented story about how that happened. Elias decided to find out how it really happened by reading etiquette books going back to the late Middle Ages. Uh, there are different editions of the translation. In one edition, there, it's two volumes, and the first volume is called The History of Manners. Um, and it kind of sounds like this. You look back at these early etiquette books. If you wish to show yourself to be a truly refined gentleman, when you spit at table, don't spit over the shoulder of the person sitting opposite you as hunters do, but on the ground. Um, this is an amazing book. Alan Buchanan put me onto it, and I'm really glad he did. Um, I, can, I can recommend this as a read. That's great. And what is your favorite movie? Well, also, as with books, if you see enough movies, you don't have a favorite movie, so I don't have one. Mm -hmm. um, I see too many movies for that. Uh, but there is a very cool movie I saw a while back that's kind of in my head. Yeah. Um, uh, Walden. Actually, I'm sure I'm mispronouncing that. If you say Walden, people will assume it's about Thoreau or something. And this is a, I think it must, the movie must have been made in Austria. So it would just be Walden, right? Um, it's a kind of art project documentary that yeah. tracks a tree that is harvested in a forest in Austria and gradually converted to lumber and eventually, I think, to a stack of boards and ends up in a logging camp somewhere in Brazil. Um, it's a very slow moving movie. Oh. If you, you have to have patience. If you like uh, Chantal Ackerman or Eric Romer movies, you might like this one. Um, I like it a lot. Mm. Interesting. Would you tell us one favorite hobby that you would have? Uh, my hobbies are really boring. Um, I cook and I, I, I hike. Um, the hiking, though, there is a philosophical puzzle in it, um, which makes so it's, um, you know, being out in nature is very important. It kind of keeps your mind sort of reoriented. It's a kind of it's part. It keeps you sane. And um, I don't know of any philosophical view that accommodates that very basic fact about life, that you need to be out in nature every now and again. Um, and I'm very fortunate where I am. Salt Lake City has great hiking, uh, mm -hmm. uh, hiking scenery. Great. An inspirational person? An inspirational person. I had a teacher, um, Robert Nozick. He... Um, Uh, he's mostly known uh, to the sort of outside world, I mean, the world outside philosophy, as a kind of theorist of libertarianism. Uh, people know him as the author of a book called Anarchy State Utopia. Yeah. But that's not why he's inspirational to me. Um, when I was in graduate school for a semester, I roomed with this guy who was, I guess he was a postdoc from Switzerland or somewhere, and he had come to work with Nozick on political philosophy, on, you know, libertarianism and anarchy state utopia. And I remember the look on his face of dismay, actually, when he got back from Nozick's office from that initial meeting, and Nozick had told him that he didn't work on political theory anymore and actually had no opinions about it. So here's why this is inspirational. Academics in general and philosophers in particular, they tend to get wedded to whatever idea they think of. It becomes theirs and they sort of 
they, they defend it till the day of their death. They're not going to give it up. They're not going to change their mind. Nozick had a very different approach. The moment he published something, he was free to just drop it and walk away from it. And I think that's inspiring. We should have more of that. It's a very good point. And I, I would add at this point that there's a Brazilian musician. He is called Hermeto Pascual. And he has been mm -hmm. doing music for a long, very long time. And he has been very innovative for at least for over 30 years. And one thing that he said that it impacted me as well is that he said, I create the music, I compose, we record it, but when I have the LP or the CD ready, I don't want to listen to it anymore. I, I move. And it's something that... I, I, yeah. I used to wonder what it would be like to be a rock star, not in the fantasy way. Um, rock stars get performances and they're expected to play the same music again and again and again. They want, the audience wants the hits. If I had to do anything like this, if people, if I turned up at some venue to read a paper, people say, we don't want your new paper. We want one of the, your golden oldie, right? A paper you were done with 15 years ago. It would drive me absolutely nuts. <laughs> Maybe. A place you would like to visit? Ah, uh, well, you know, I was once taken for a walk in Genoa by a guy who uh, knows his way around the literary history of the uh, of the town, mm -hmm. and we were kind of near the water, and he pointed to a spot on the water, and he, uh, I guess, lit crit types would call this a triple erasure. Um, he said. In that, over that spot, there used to be a pier. And on that pier, there used to be a restaurant. And in that restaurant, Nietzsche used to have lunch. So I guess I'd like to go back to Genoa. You know, I'm working on Nietzsche. I'm trying to wrap my mind around the way he thought and his life and the way he lived. I don't think I could have lunch on that very spot because the pier is gone and it's just water. But I think I'd like to have lunch nearby. That's great. And the last question. If you could complete the sentence, a meaningful life for me is? It's what I'm doing right now. Okay. Dr. Mugram, thank you very much for your time today. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's been uh, uh, very interesting on my end also. Mm -hmm.